Hollywood Forever, Section 1, Grandfather Had Cool. Grandfather had cool. That is to say, he photographed well. Wool cap, blazer and tie, Harold Hall cut a romantic figure, turned out as a kind of 1940s Jack London, a man of the world. It was the just-so way his hand tucked into the pants pocket, the wrist just above tagging back his sport coat to a natty angle, so very hip. Or the studied insouciance with which his cigarette was poised between his fingers. Guy was the bee's knees. While most striking of all, leaning against a post as one would lean against a future that is rolling out like a red carpet, Harold had a way of staring off in the distance as if something important existed just over the horizon, something waiting just for him, the cat's meow. This was the 1940s in Duluth, Minnesota, in a time before the ubiquitous family camera, the Kodak snapshot, my grandfather struck everyday poses like a movie star. It's a fair bet that's how he bagged Helen Lundine my grandmother. The problem with the man's striking film star-like appearances is that the real-life movie of Harold Hall might well have been titled The Lousy Husband and Father. The man may have looked devil-may-care, but as a husband and father, he was simply the devil. A heavy drinking man, Harold tore into his wife. As soon as his eldest son was old enough to defend his mother, the boy became object of the blows. Sullen and mean, Harold was a junkyard dog, snapping and barking and biting at anything that moved in his territory. Quite possibly, he objected to his role as husband and father and dreamed of missing glamour, glamour that drifted just over the horizon. Section 2, A Trip to the Theater. Ironically, since that era, that very character, the cruel and drunken patriarch, has made his way into the world of film, becoming one of its stock characters, an artistic trope. Countless films have starred that bitter soul, garbed in tattered white undershirt, the man sweaty and clinging to a half-empty bottle. In a strange sense, however indirect, Harold made his way into glamour, over that horizon, and into the movies, stepping up as the bad seed known to story vernacular as the antagonist. Yet, for the real world Harold of the 1940s, posing before the camera lens, smoking, a steel lift bridge and a great lake and an island of industry behind him, a different future than he imagined was to unfold. You see, I never met my grandfather ever. Indeed, he never met any of his grandchildren. That's because Harold Hall was destined to star alone in his own sad and sorry movie, scene after scene alone, with no one at whom the dirty dog could bark and bite. And it's all the doing of one woman, my grandmother, Helen. For Helen turned out to be a woman in possession of courage and calm. She was the one who had real moxie. And, significantly, she was a woman with a much better idea for a film to star in. Cool, baby. And picked up, got in a train, went with her son who was 13 and me who was just turning 19 and went to California. And so we moved and they, they went around, look, they did most of the looking and they finally found this place in Hollywood, a little duplex, a little stucco building, very typical Hollywood, very cute. And we thought we'd gone to heaven, a, had a grass patch out in front in a garage. Don thought that he, had, he, was, he liked to fix cars and work on cars and tinker and so he had to have a garage. So um, it was a nice little California street with palm trees and in, it was in Hollywood. <laughs> I had Hollywood for an address. <laughs> they were just kind of getting over into TV, but there was mostly still radio shows. And so my mother was the one, I don't know how she scored the tickets, but she went everywhere. And we, we went to see uh, 
Uh, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, all live on stage. Red Skelton we saw many times, and he was, you know, we were, there were like 50 people in the audience, and he was quite a performer. He would get up there, and after the show was over, he would just hang around and say, do you want to see Gertrude? And he'd do Gertrude, and he just liked to entertain people. So I remember standing on the street in Los Angeles and looking around and saying, I'm in California, you know, and it's October, and I've got just short sleeves on, and you know, it was just, you know, that was pretty magical, realizing I was really in California. When my mom got on that train to go to Southern California with her family, uh, she more or less was killing two birds with one stone. She uh, left behind an unhappy marriage, which left, had some potential for further issues in her life, and she fulfilled a dream she'd had since she was a young woman to move to California. In the year of 1951, Helen undertook to do something that women of the time mostly did not do. A single mom with kids, she weighed anchor for the land of TV, film, and radio stars, and she never looked back. Time passed. The 1960s, an era in which everyone was to starve for 15 minutes, passed into the 1970s, an era of new liberties, new lifestyles, and new looks. Her children grown and married with kids. Helen lived alone, comfortable in a duplex near Sunset Strip, girdled by the distant sound of motorcycles, commerce, and fame. A job well done. Her family embarked on bustling lives in a tumultuous decade. She coasted quietly into aging, a humble but happy ending to her own Hollywood movie. Or so it seemed. For something unexpected happened. And it happened fast. In her 60s, Helen met a man at church, Dave Hartman. And to the surprise of everyone, Helen's star was to begin anew as she set forth on a highly successful sequel, part two of the life of a solid woman. Dave became the accidental and faux executive producer for Helen's new role, a role very different from family heroine one even closer to Hollywood movie lights. Lights, camera, action. After Helen married Dave, the couple located themselves in Dave's fanciful family home, an aging yet elegant mansion in West Hollywood on June Street, a neighborhood of Hollywood filmmakers and foreign diplomats, ultra green lawns and neat rows of palm trees. The mansion was perfectly cinematic, with its French doors and maid staircase running up the center of the house. So the Hartmans put themselves on a local register, a book and official listing that is browsed by filmmakers seeking locations for their productions. The listing turned the tables for Helen, for the woman who once whisked her family off to be in the home of the stars, those stars now came to her home. <laughs> Five home delivery stars. Jonathan Winters came first, shooting one of his hefty bag commercials in the Hartman's driveway. A young Jim Carrey appeared in the Hartman mansion early in his career. Other stars and movies and commercials followed. But the most memorable visit for Helen was when the Hartman mansion hosted Sid Caesar, Milton Berle, Maury Amsterdam, and Danny Thomas. The comedians were shooting a television movie called Side by Side. Many scenes were shot in the Hartman Mansion living room, bedrooms, dining room, recreation room, and patio. While in between scenes, the Hartmans dined with the stars, and Helen nursed Milton Berle's cold with a dose of vitamins from her own stash. Talk about the cat's pajamas. <laughs> Six. Hollywood Forever. Helen lived to a ripe old age of 94, passing away in the summer of 2006. However, Helen's brush with celebrity was not yet over. There was to be another sequel, part three. You see, by odd coincidence, it turned out that Dave's family was in possession of a prepaid burial plot, and that plot resided in a funeral park called Hollywood Forever. Located in the back of the old Paramount Studios, whose gold walls still frame the south side of the cemetery, Hollywood Forever lays claim to a crush of celebrity burials. 
And this was to be Helen's final resting place. On the day of Helen's funeral, our chauffeured black limo passed a line of people waiting for entrance to Hollywood Forever. Turns out the cemetery was showing horror films as a part of their business. These folks were there for the show. On the day of Helen's funeral, we mourners drove past none other than a movie line. Sunday, August 13th, 2006. We buried Helen among the stars. Uh, it was a long walk, even in the winter when it was very, very cold. And then we'd go up there and have, have dinner. And then there, they had a son there who I used to play games with. We played checkers or some kind of games. Also. And uh, then we'd walk all the way home. We'd probably get home about midnight. It wasn't uncommon to do that. Do you have any idea how far Proctor is? How long it it was considered three miles from Duluth, I believe. Yeah, that's there. what they used to say, it was three miles. Dolores said, how long did it take you to walk there? Oh, about an hour or so, I believe. Grandpa would close up the store and go up, you know, at maybe five, six o'clock and walk up there. And when did you used to go to the barn dances in Asco? Well, that was with my friend Edith. Uh, after they had, they knew people in Asco, Minnesota. Which is where, where from Duluth? Yeah, uh, that's about 60 miles from Duluth on the way to Minneapolis area. How did you get that? By car, by uh, a Mr. Johnson <laughs> had one of these old cars, uh, a big, one of the old big cars. He was the only one that they knew that had a car, I think. And he came over and, and we, we drove in that. I remember driving in a, it was one of the real large cars and I would sit, there was quite a few of us, so I would sit on a little seat in, the, in between the seats. They were that large, in between the back seat I had a little stand that I was sitting on. What year are we talking about here? Yeah. Oh, I don't really know what year. I was about, I was about 12, 11 or 12, something like that. So what year was that? And then, uh, uh, I, I can't think of you. Okay. I don't think I can remember Didn't that. Didn't you just live with me for a while? And then, well, then we, after we met her more, they were old friends, but after that, uh, I became good friends with her and she, they, they were kind of poor people, and she didn't. Uh, they let her come home with me and live with my folks. They, she was going to do hospital care. Was she Danish so, too? Yes. Oh yes. What was Edith? What was your Edith, maiden name? Edith uh, Christensen. Christensen. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that same evening, then before we came back, they had this big barn dance, and we were all crazy to stay for that barn dance. And they, the, the folks allowed us to do that. And it was about midnight before we even started for home. And uh, we got home about four o'clock in the morning. Wow! It took that long with that car. It was about sixty miles. Away. What did Asco look like? Was it a farming community? Real, yeah, they had, we were on a big farm. It was a little tiny town with one horse town, you know, mm -hmm. one one uh, street. What was town. the barn dance like? Oh, it was fun. We we had a lot of fun. Man. That's there a handsome was young man there. Young fellows around, you know. What did he use for music? Ah, uh, the old. Uh, they don't stuff? Yeah, they accordion? Yeah, accordions. Yeah, accordions. Mostly accordions they had in there. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We enjoyed that. Yeah, was it really in the barn? Oh, yes. Upstairs in the hayloft. Oh. <laughs> they had streetcars. Uh, they at least had streetcars. Yeah, cars. there were streetcars. Oh, yeah, if you wanted to go away, what was called uptown. We went on a streetcar. Mm -hmm. Grandpa did own a car at one time, but he was a very poor driver. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't remember what the year it was, but he well, did over, I think it was an Overland he had. Well, you, didn't you tell me that he had a truck and that's how you taught yourself to drive? Well, yeah, but the, the truck was used by Roy. When Roy Pond, you know, was the delivery That was Margaret's husband. Margaret's husband offered to be a delivery man. That was before, that was when he came into the truck age, I mean, before it was horse and buggy. Mm -hmm. And then, then that's when he had the truck. He never drove that truck, but Roy did. And it was left in our garage. It would, used to be the barn became a garage, but that was when Edith and I one night decided that we would go out and take the car out. <laughs> they were out somewhere for the evening and we took the key and I went down over the garage and took the car out. I'd never been tried it before. We went all the way to, uh, it was kind of a one-ton truck is what it was. <laughs> and we went to the West End up there and 
course, leaving it all the boys on the way. <laughs> we, Were you about we, 16 or 17? Uh, probably 15, 14, 15. Oh, my goodness. Not very old. <laughs> and uh, we had a ball. Were there many cars on the road in those days? Mm, no, no. Did you go up Grand Avenue? Yeah, we went Grand Avenue up to West End. Mm -hmm. And then we turned around, came back. And how I got the car in the garage, I don't know, but I did. And they <laughs> never knew it, and they never knew that we took that up. <laughs> Well, you and um, Edith used to do some other things. Are you and a friend about uh, uh, when you were out late? Oh, yes. We, uh, when they would leave the house, she, Grandma said we had to be in by 9 or 9.30 always. And we didn't like that too well. So when they were out, we thought we would change the clock. So we put it back about an hour. <laughs> so when they came back, we figured uh, they would think we were in at 9 o'clock. It was really 10. Really 10. <laughs> They never caught on, at least for a long time. Grandpa probably opened the store late that day. 